Gentlemen, welcome and thank you. Uh, we're coming to you today from the Master Health Forum at McMaster University for our latest in a series of Queen Elizabeth Scholarship webinars. Uh, today we are going to hear from uh, Faraz, who did some very interesting work in uh, London, England. So again, thank you for joining us here in the room and online. Um, uh, I'll go through a quick little summary of the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program, um, what the forum does, uh, and then we'll have Faraz's presentation. Uh, Faraz's presentation is going to be a little bit different than our previous Queen Elizabeth Scholarship presentations. He's going to present what he did while he was uh, on his internship as part of a scholarship, and then he's going to spend a little time talking on a little bit more personal level about what he personally got from the, the scholarship and his life events that brought him to this point and what he's taking home with him uh, from his experiences. So a little bit different uh, presentation today. I hope you enjoy yourselves. At the end, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. If you're online, uh, we're going to ask that you use the chat window. For those of you in the room, we'll have an opportunity to ask those questions when the time comes. So, uh, very quickly, um, what is the McMaster Health Forum? For those of you in the room, you're actually sitting in the McMaster Health Forum right now. Um, we act as a leading hub for improving health outcomes through collective problem solving. Uh, our goal is to harness information, information, convene stakeholders, prepare action-oriented leaders, and we act as an agent of change by empowering stakeholders. Uh, we are here today because of the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program. Uh, this is a program that is run uh, through a partnership between Rideau Hall, the Community Foundations of Canada, Universities Canada, and individual Canadian universities. The purpose of the program is to act as an advocate to advocate a dynamic community of young global leaders across the Commonwealth to create lasting impacts both at home and, ac and abroad through cross-cultural exchanges encompassing international education, discovery and inquiry, and professional experiences. Uh, the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program here at the Forum focuses on the mandate of the Forum, which is to strengthen health systems. So all of our scholars undertake internships and scholarship opportunities that involve uh, strengthening health systems, and they become a part of our large and growing network of health system leaders. This is a list of our current Queen Elizabeth Scholars. Uh, we have incoming scholars, outgoing scholars, and outgoing interns, uh, and we are accepting applications uh, all the time, so feel free if you're interested to apply. Uh, we accept applications on a rolling uh, basis, so there is no application deadline. Uh, you just apply when you're ready to apply. Our speaker today is our Queen Elizabeth Scholar, uh, Faraz. Uh, Faraz uh, is currently a PhD candidate in the Health Policy Program here at McMaster. Uh, his work focuses on how health systems react to crisis situations in low- and middle-income countries. Uh, while he was at Georgia's University School of Medicine, he was a recipient of the International Peace Scholarship and the prestigious Humanitarian Award. And since he's been here at McMaster, not only has he been awarded, I'll turn it over to him and pr uh, for his presentation. Thank you. I feel like saved the applause to the end. <laughs> I might I deserve it by the end of this. No, I'm kidding. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to present this. I feel this is the second time I present this. The first time I presented it was I was invited by MSF, and I'll talk about it a bit at the end, um, to go to their European operations meeting to talk to them about how they can strengthen their own health system. I thought a lot very long and hard this morning about how to start this presentation. And I had a very different way of thinking about how I'm going to phrase this and put it in the bigger context of things. But I think I'm just going to take a quick moment to say, given the situation that happened last night with the U.S. elections, I think it's a reminder that although health systems might be separate from governance, the two are very much interconnected. And although my topic is on the Syrian refugee crisis, what we have to remember as people who are involved in healthcare research is that governance can affect the way we deliver healthcare, and one crisis can translate to another. So the point that I'm trying to make is that now more than ever do we need to be more educated about the best way to use research evidence to make decisions. My work over the summer was to conduct a 90-day research practicum at Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, in the UK. I wanted to look at how can we strengthen health systems in the middle of a crisis. That's the bigger overall umbrella of what I'm looking at. Specifically, I chose the Syrian refugee crisis, and as a case study, I picked MSF as an organization. For you who are not familiar with what the MSF is, Médecins Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without Borders, is one of the leading humanitarian organizations in the world, with more than 20-year history of doing uh, humanitarian and medical aid interventions in some of the most volatile and fragile situations around the world. 
So just as an opening remark, I think it's important to, to contextualize my research within uh, an internally driven quality improvement exercise. And the reason I say that is because it didn't follow the standard methods of a research uh, procedure. It, it, when you do a quality improvement exercise, you're more integrating with the organization to make sure that all your research findings are being put into place. MSF has graciously uh, granted me permission to present this information on their behalf and without making sure that I do not disclose any individual's identity. The reason why I bring this is because it's a, an urge for me to any other uh, NGO people uh, around who are hearing this presentation to allow this kind of research, to allow the transparency in the process uh, for people to be able to conduct research within their own organization. Okay. So to get to the bulk of the content, of my, I realize I'm standing right underneath the slide, so I'll just move the slide a little bit. Uh, efforts to bridge the gaps between research, practice, and policy making is what some have called knowledge translation. So you will hear the word knowledge trans translation being used often. Especially nowadays, it's being, being, being pushed forward by some of the main organizations like CIHR. You always hear the word KT, but it's sometimes hard to make sure that you understand what that concept is. And in simple words, it's the way that we can ensure that decisions are made on the best research evidence that is out there. And it has become a very much a, a, an important contributor to the way health policy systems are engaged around the world. Now, there have been many gaps that have been identified in literature about efforts to strengthen the way we, decisions are made. We, the, the literature has been looking at lack of uh, barriers and facilitators to different KT. So what works in what situations? And why does it work? And why does it not work? Now, it has been over a thousand systematic reviews that have examined the effectiveness of strategies to support evidence informed practice. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, why is it important to have evidence informed practice? Because organizations like MSF now are held accountable for the decisions they make. MSF could be just a case study, but that can apply to any other organization that are conducting uh, work to strengthen health systems in a crisis situation. We can no longer accept that decisions are made based on personal intuition. There has to be some kind of justification behind the reason the decision is made. It's even more important when we're talking about situations that are volatile and fragile. And there's been a systematic review of 124 observational studies that have identified the factors that need to be addressed by strategies to support evidence-informed practice. And the reality is that existing resources can be mobilized with sufficient speed to address the issue of timeliness. And the reason why timeliness is important, we just saw this. We saw it with Ebola, we saw it with SARS, and now we're seeing it with the Syrian refugee crisis. Time is of the essence, especially in a crisis situation. The larger context of my research is that there's over 4 million refugees now, as of today, the numbers are actually a bit higher than that, that have fled the conflict in Syria. The majority of them now reside in the following countries, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, and Egypt. If you just take one second and think about those four countries, my math is wrong, five countries. If you take a minute to think about those five countries, what is the one common denominator? The reality is all those countries suffer from one thing. They are overburdened and under-resourced healthcare systems. And if you can understand and accept that simple truth, it will help you realize the importance of research like this and work to look to make sure that resource allocations in settings that are overburdened and under-resourced is truly based on the best available research evidence, because there's not a lot of it. And that's what my, my, this slide is trying to speak at, that there are efforts to use to support the use of research evidence in decision-making and have become a very important component of any organization. MSF happens to be one of the main ones doing any work in it, but this applies to any other organization. Now, from this slide, you see that the majority of actually residing in Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, um, and Egypt, which are all the neighboring countries of Syria. And unfortunately, the geographical location of Syria doesn't allow it to be neighbor allow it to be neighbored by countries that already have existing strong structures. The countries that are around them are actually weak. Jordan is going through a massive disaster right now of not being able to equip themselves to take care of the Syrian refugees. We see it in Lebanon. We see it very much in Iraq. To my surprise through my research is that Iraq actually houses some of the biggest population of Syrian refugees and, and often arguably said they are doing a phenomenal job in the way they're delivering healthcare to the Syrian refugee. Keep in mind that Iraq is still undergoing a war. 
but they're able to take those in. So it is very important that whatever resources those countries have, the, the decisions they make and how they allocate those resources is based on the best available research evidence. What's the problem? Well, the challenge of delivering evidence, evidence-informed, medical and humanitarian interventions can be broadly described under three main themes. And this is based on literature research I've done. The production of research evidence in crisis situation is challenging. And that's quite basic when you think about it. We're dealing with a vol volatile, fragile situation. Being able to produce research evidence in those crisis situations is very difficult, especially for organizations that don't have the infrastructure. In crisis situations, there is a gap on how to best utilize research evidence to inform decision-making in the field. And finally, there is a need to examine the organizational capacity. Because it's one thing to say that there needs to be more use of research evidence. But in order for that to happen, there needs to be structures around it that support that. So my question is based on two things. What are some of MSF's approaches to supporting evidence-informed decision-making in healthcare delivery for the Syrian refugees? And what are some of those barriers and facilitators that we talk about often and mentioned in literature to support those approaches? I did that by doing a review and then a key informant interviews of the major stakeholders from around the world that are involved in decision-making of capacity. I really want to get straight to the results because I think that's where the interesting talk begins. And overall, I was able, over a three-month period, I was able to interview nine major stakeholders, two of them being senior researchers. Uh, five of them being senior management. And when we talk about senior management, we're talking about heads of operations, people who are actually making decisions of what programs are implemented, what kind of delivery we're going to do, what kind of shelter access or security we're going to implement. Those are people who are, they have the pulse of the Syrian refugee needs, and within a, with a finger, they can make decisions that can influence the future of the Syrian refugees. And finally, two heads of missions. And the, the heads of mission that I, that I spoke to were from Iraq and from Lebanon, two, one, of, one of the two major sites of where Syrian refugees are being housed. The results are divided into basic things. The first one is, what is MSF's approach to supporting evidence inform? So what is actually going on in the field? The reality is that research evidence in humanitarian sector is used in medical and humanitarian aid interventions. But in reality, it's actually not used in strengthening health systems. I hope you can see the distinction between medical and humanitarian. There is a difference between the two. And that's something I learned through my, my work with MSF. When we talk about medical interventions, we're talking about treatments. We're talking about vaccines, drugs, um, surgery settings, ER, triage. But when we talk about humanitarian aid, we're talking about access, food, clean water, shelter, two very different things. And it amazes me that now, from somebody who I've worked with WHO for many years and been involved in the humanitarian sector, I actually was never clear about the distinction between the two. And it becomes clear when you take a critical look into a crisis situation and realize, actually, the way research evidence is used in each one of those settings is very different. It's not the same. The reason why I bring that up is because, for example, at MSF, through my, my interviews, what became very clear is that most NGOs would use, they have a much higher prevalence of using research evidence for medical interventions. And that kind of makes sense. It's intuitive in the logic because there is a lot of evidence that actually exists out there with the Cochrane reviews and systematic reviews on what is the best way to treat Ebola. What's the best way to treat even as simple as a, as a cold or a flu? But there isn't enough systematic way of uh, contextualizing research and producing research about what is the best way to build a shelter for a Syrian refugee? What is the best way to ensure access to healthcare for the Syrian refugees? So what does that leave organizations like MSF to do? It leads them to rely on past experience and personal intuition. And that is great for the most part, but where we're facing a problem now in the NGO world is that per past experience and personal intuition is hard to defend. Lately, if you've been following the news, you know that MSF has taken a leadership role in trying to say, listen, our healthcare providers and health systems are under attack. They have become a target. And they've been held accountable at member states to say, well, on what basis are you delivering care for those people that you claim are in jeopardy that you can't even provide care for them? And they can no longer use past experience and personal intuition of how they delivered care in the past as enough justification for military intervention. This is just an example to show you 
why there's a need for this kind of research, to look at ways to strengthen organizational use of research evidence. Secondly, there has to be a balance between the systematic use of research evidence and personal intuition. My research shown that we're not saying that you should abandon personal intuition. On the contrary, there is knowledge to be gained from being able to rely on research evidence. MSF is an organization that's been doing this for 20 years. They've won the Nobel Prize for their work in humanitarian aid. Same as ICRC, the Red Cross, same as any of the other organizations, which all share the same findings. What we're saying is that there has to be some form of a balance between your ability as an organization to strengthen the health systems by using existing guidelines and your own personal intuition. And that's going to take time because there is resistance towards it that I'll talk about it in the barriers. Now, there are some facilitators out there to help organizations like MSF to strengthen the health system. What are they? First of all, MSF, what it does quite well is that it's con continuously engaged, uh, sends its field staff to field visits. So the point of the field visit, and this came out from all the interviews that we conducted, they send their staff to the field, they do, they identify the knowledge gaps, they see what the problems are, they bring it back to headquarters level, and then there's a systematic way of trying to say, all right, here's the issue, this is how we're going to deal with it. And the quote that came out from a, one of the major, major main stakeholders said, field trips allow for a critical look into what's happening in projects, to formulate clear research questions, and to come back to the field with more evidence to improve the current situation. If you just take a second and read that over and over again, you realize the simple truth, which is that is great and fantastic in a normal situation. But would that be applicable in a crisis, fast evolving, fragile situation? And the simple truth is no. This is not adequate for a situation that's changing every second. And the perfect example that I can think about is Ebola. I was a coordinator at WHO when we were dealing with the Ebola crisis. And the simple truth that came out of that crisis was, we didn't, time was not a luxury. We didn't have time on our hand to wait on making decisions. Decisions had to be made right away. And we had to have access to research evidence in a very quick time frame. Secondly, MSF uses surveys, which is quite unique for an organization like MSF that doesn't have a strong research infrastructure. And almost often, all NGOs don't have a strong research infrastructure and are changing that now because they're realizing the truth be some kind of a use of a system be some kind of a use of a systematic use of research evidence. If you've been following the news, you'll notice that WHO, for example, now is implementing an emergency um, emergency preparedness organization within its larger organization. And that's if you follow the progression of WHO over the years, you know that's a huge departure from what they've been doing and how what they stand for as an organization. The findings in the survey help to structure operational needs. Because we need, an organization like MSF needs to justify where the donor money is going, going from. People don't, actually, MSF has the most money in terms of donations per year, and it's one of the most profitable, it's a nonprofit organization, but it's the most profitable organization in terms of donation. So they need to be able to justify where the money goes for. And one of the main mandates of MSF is that all research must be con related somehow to the operational needs of the organization. And the perfect example that came out of my research was NCDs, non-communicable diseases. People always thought that with Syrian refugees, the main problem is going to be trauma from post-traumatic stress disorder, which is very much prevalent. And, and I'll be mistaken not to say that is one of the most prevalent problems of Syrian refugees. Of course, you have the war trauma that comes with it. But in terms of the health issue that the system has to deal with, what is the biggest one that came out of that? is non-communicable diseases. The reality is 82% of Syrian refugees right now suffer from either hypertension, cardiovascular disease, or arthritis. That's a major problem. The health systems need to be ready to be able to strengthen them and to be able to answer those needs. Because non-communicable diseases, what they require is management, is follow-up, is being able to see your primary care provider over a long period of time. And MSF wouldn't have known that if they weren't able to conduct surveys. MSF's position as an emergency care provider in crisis situations allows it to be not only a user, but also a generator of research evidence. In cases like Congo and DRC, MSF is the only organization that's in the field. That makes it in a novel position, being able to take all that research evidence, package it and generate it and let others use it. A situation that doesn't happen at the, at the time. An example of that is the NCD management among the Syrian refugees in Jordan. Jordan took some of the most 
number of Syrian refugees. And when they arrived, I traveled. I was fortunate enough during my internship to travel to Jordan to go and see what the situation is like. You know, you read a lot about the Syrian refugee crisis. And I know I am very aware that we've also become a bit jaded about what's going on because I think a huge part of us is we're tired of hearing about the Syrian refugee crisis. But when you actually see what's going on in the field, your perspective of the need of this kind of research changes. You realize that, and it has been stated, that the Syrian refugee crisis is arguably the biggest public health crisis we've ever dealt with in our lives. And the sad truth is, it's nowhere close to being over. And you see the ramification of the Syrian refugee crisis in a country like Jordan, which is so overburdened with the number of refugees it has, whether they're Palestinian, Iraqi, and now Syrian, and extremely under-resourced. MSF was able to, what it was able to do in Jordan is generate evidence about NCDs that helped to do, generate more money to help NCD care within the Syrian refugees. And what MSF does that I think is an important facilitator is that it connects all relevant research to operational needs and decision-making capacity. That helps it to have a transparent process of how decisions are made. But there are obviously some clear barriers out there. There is still a lack of receptive environment. Whether we like it or not, there are still people in decision-making capacity at organizations like this that don't believe in research evidence, that don't see the need for it, that they believe it actually holds back the organization. You have to look at the work that the organization does to understand where, how it actually makes the decisions. And an organization like MSF that's been doing this for a long time, sometimes the people who are in decision-making capacity don't be believe that research is more of a bookish thing that it belongs to the academic world and it's not connected the way we actually do things in reality. And there is no collaborative effort among the five operational centers. MSF is divided to five operational centers in five different places. Amsterdam, Barcelona, Paris, Brussels, and Geneva. I always get them wrong, so I'm always surprised when I get them right. Um, and the thing is, those five centers are where the decisions are made. But it amazed me through my research to find out that there's actually no clear collaborative efforts between them. Decisions are very much made in silo structure. And I have to reiterate a point I started in my presentation saying, although I'm talking specifically about MSF, you have to understand that when you look at the context of crisis situations, MSF often is the only provider of healthcare. So it, it is on its own, arguably, a health system. This is why this research translates to other sectors. Stakeholders searching that new context new, new, need new evidence. The world is changing, and it's changing at such a rapid phase that whatever evidence that we have at our disposal is no longer relevant. And the Syrian refugee crisis is a perfect example of that. Because in the past, MSF was dealing with situations like infectious diseases mainly. But what the Syrian refugee comes with, it comes with non-communicable diseases. That's a new reality. We need to generate more evidence about that. We need to find better evidence to be able to deal with that. And we need to do it in a short time frame because people's lives are in, at stake. And fourth, and I think is the last point in barriers, there's a lack of a formalized process. So what, I ha what came out of my interviews is that a lot of people that I spoke to in the field were saying, listen, that's great that you're saying we need to use more research evidence or decision making. But the truth of the matter is when we ask for it, nobody's getting back to us. Nobody's giving us the research evidence or they're taking very long time. We don't even know who to reach out to. We've done our part, but why is the decision maker people are not contributing back? And I, I, I put this forward in my recommendations and one of the ways to move forward with this. I was warned about the clickers, just making sure that I don't skip a slide. So what are the implications now? That's, what my research has done is being able to put forward some of the things that organizations like MSF and other fragile health systems can do to work on strengthening the way they deliver health care. Those organizations need to develop infrastructure. So we start with a big picture, then we go small. The big picture is that we need to develop, implement, and strengthen this research infrastructure to support the conduct and the use of research evidence within MSF for, or with clear creation of roles. You can't expect research evidence to be used in decision making if there's no organizational support behind it. But what the, so we can't use the word support loosely either. What do we mean by support? We mean, we mean buy-in. Stakeholders, decision makers have to be convinced of the need of this in order for them to offer the support for it. And financial support. 
There's money that's involved with hiring people and training them to have that kind of infrastructure. And I put forward the creation of this idea that actually came out from the McMaster Health Forum, which is a formalized rapid response research unit, which to me, organizations like MSF is very much the type of organization that will benefit the most out of this. And I'll talk a little bit about this in my next slide. What do I mean by the rapid response research unit? So after all these interviews I conducted and all the time that I spent traveling around the world talking to people, what came very clear is twofold. People want to do this. There is a receptive climate for it but there's no mechanism to actually do this. So what can we do? Currently, the way it's done is we have a problem in the field. I have a Syrian refugee with, with arthritis who can't get access to a rheumatologist. So I determined the problem. They list the possible options. This is what happens right now in the field. They decide what's the best option to deal with that patient who has arthritis. They make a decision and then they reassess. But the problem is the time frame that it takes for this to happen is extremely long. It frustrates the people in the field. They can't make decisions fast enough. Healthcare is not being delivered at an adequate pace that it needs to. So what I'm recommending is let's create a rapid response research unit. housed within the research structure of every OC center, of the five OC centers. And what the rapid response research unit would do is it will identify, it would be a formalized structure where people in the field would reach out to this unit with a formalized form and say, listen, we're dealing with this crisis right now. This is the problem we're facing. Can you provide us with the best research evidence on how to adequately answer that? It's a simple idea, but it takes a correct climate, the appropriate climate to accept the idea. And what it will do is that it will make this process much faster, much more adequate, and a lot more effective. It will respond to the field needs, and it will satisfy the decision makers at the same time. We need to conduct the research. Given that MSF is often the, the only user and generator of research crisis situations, we need to ensure that research knowledge generated by MSF is being utilized and being directly linked to operational needs. I keep going back to this point because every single interview I conducted and every single person I talked to, this is the one point they kept bringing up. If it is not connected to operational needs, it's not relevant. We don't care about it. We they, I must, they can take advantage of its ability to share the knowledge, um, the, the knowledge that it generates through the field. And that's one of the things that the rapid response units can do. All this evidence is being generated in the field. They can package it somehow in an evidence brief, for example, one to two pages in an easy format for people to read and understand and share that knowledge with other organizations that are doing similar work. It will foster a more collaborative environment for them in the bigger scheme of things. Strengthen the field mission staff. So we go from the big picture to the small picture. Well, what about the field staff? Can they actually identify what are the most prominent research questions? We can't expect people in the field on their own to come up with the research questions. We need to somehow provide them with the support. And the way we provide that support is run training programs and workshops through this rapid response research unit. I want to conclude my presentation by saying that, you know, this is the first study of its type that is done as an integrated KT plan, where it was completed through partnership with the ultimate user. And what I mean by that is that a year ago, actually more than a year ago now, I started the conversation with MSF about doing my work with them. And every step of the process, it went through ups and downs and hurdles, and, and things went smoothly at some points and not in others. But the point that I'm trying to make is that this type of research where you are, in, where you are collaborating with the research user, ensures that whatever findings are happening is actually being implemented. And I'll give you a perfect example of that. When I started my research, my work with MSF, I got a lot of backlash, I'll be very honest. It was partly my fault because I think you have to be, and it's a humbling experience because you remind yourself that when you're put in a new context, you have to adapt to the working environment. And there was a notion that I came with my Canadian way of scholarly thinking to an organization that's been doing things for 20 years, and I was just trying to impose my knowledge on an organization. And luckily, MSF is very open to the idea of being very self-critical on itself, that it allowed my kind of work to happen. And what the strength of that is, the recommendation to anybody who's looking to do this kind of work is engage the user early on. Make them part of the process. Appreciate their hiccups about some of the issues you're trying to do. Because at the end of the day, the findings that you come out of your research will actually have great impact. As of now, MSF is actually considering, through the governing board that's meeting up, up in May, to establish the rapid response research unit. When I came up with the idea a month and a half into my research practicum and internship, it was a no-go. 
So I went from having it not even a possibility of discussion to now being on the table for discussion with the governance board. That's a huge leap. And the, the reason why I bring that up is it wouldn't have happened if I didn't have an integrated KT plan. Now, there is obviously some limitations, and that needs to be pointed out. The study only focused on the UK and Geneva. It didn't take into account other operational centers, but the reality is they're all similar and very much the same structure because they all follow the same constitution, governing constitution. The implication of future research, after I finished my, re my internship, I, this all feeds into my big thesis at McMaster University under Dr. John Levis. I'm proposing, I'm proposing to complete three separate studies, which will dig deeper into the questions that I came about from the internship. And I hopefully will be developing a conceptual framework surrounding what are the barriers and facilitators of real-time KT. How can we develop, how can we come up with a more timeliness approach to using research evidence? So I, I want to end with a, with a very strong quote that came out of one of the big directors of MSF. He said, listen, we can't work in the same way we used to 10 and 20 years ago. Back then, we were only 50 people. Now, we're 250. So you can really work in an ad hoc manner when you're only 50. But it becomes much more difficult when you are 250 people. The realities are changing. The world is changing faster than you think. We need to adapt to the needs of the current reality. And on that note, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you very much for us. So we're going to, as I said, there's two parts to his presentation. We're going to pause for a minute. We'll have some questions about this section of his presentation, and then we'll come back uh, to uh, hear from Faraz. I was intrigued by the, the five different operational centers and the fact that they kind of work in their own little silo. So I'm curious, structure of a you know, policy from a governance kind of perspective, do they all do the same things? Do they all have the same things? Do they all have the same responsibilities? Or are they doing completely different work, which is why they are segmented that way? That's actually an excellent question and something that took me a while to understand. And I had to travel to those centers to really understand how that complexity work together. They all, um, the way MSF is structured is that they're accountable to their associations and they have more than 100 associations around the world. And every association, like for example, Canada belongs to Paris, to the Paris OOC. They do different projects within the same field. So for example, for the Syrian refugees, if you are working in Iraq setting, uh, Amsterdam is the one responsible for you. But if you could be doing things for the Syrian refugees in Iraq and have a different OC, our operational center, being in charge of the way the operations are led. What all that to say is, they very much function in silo structure and there's a bit of a pride and authority in which OC center is doing which work. And that's why the idea of a rapid response research unit makes sense, because it will allow for that collaborative effort between the five OCs, so that we're not wasting resources trying to generate that research evidence, that the research evidence that's being generated and used is, is unanimously used by all five OCs. Thank you for that. So if you are online, feel free to type your questions in the chat box. Uh, anybody in the room have a question for, for us? Yes, go ahead the balance between using intuition and actual research evidence and how that may impact other NGOs going forward. It's actually funny you asked that question because I, I couldn't understand it at the beginning, this whole personal intuition ad hoc manner. They kept calling it ad hoc. And so I, I, I actually, what I ended up doing, I went to ICRC, to the Red Cross, the Federation of Red Cross, and they are the one, ICRC stands for the International Community for the Red Cross, and they're in charge of all the Red Cross around the world if you're not familiar with what the ICRC stands for. And with UNHCR, which I have colleagues that work there. And so I asked them, I was like, you know, this whole personal intuition in an ad hoc manner, like, he, I get it, but how can you justify that decision-making capacity and how can you actually balance it? I, my, my humble opinion, believe that when that distinction is being made and when an organization is able to achieve that balance, I can tell you right now that no organization has achieved that balance yet. But one, when, when one of you maybe continues this kind of work and looks into a way to establish that balance between them, I think it would revolutionize and reform the way NGOs are structured. I think the reason why it's difficult and hasn't been done yet is it's hard to contextualize and put into a concrete way this personal intuition and personal experience because every person will have a different way of doing it. Heads of mission have, uh, who are in charge of the way they deliver care in those set settings have their own way and their own experience. So who am I to say that one's experience is better than the other? And I think that's where the difficulty remains. 
I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Anybody else in the room have a question for Faraz regarding his work? In the room, if I can paraphrase, uh, is that uh, the context where healthcare is delivered by people from MSF will change depending on the situations for the different countries. So the different structures in which they work or the different healthcare systems that they are dealing with uh, is always contextual. And so um, how can MSF uh, adapt to those types of things in, in terms of the work that you've been dealing with? Actually, a good question. So I, I started my presentation by saying I was invited to the European operations meeting in London just a month ago to present my work. And one of the things that came out of that meeting is sort of addressing what you're asking for. One of the big profound findings in the people that were sitting in the room, and they were the operational head directors of all the different OCs, was they never actually thought about this idea that I bring forward in my research about health systems, that MSF does a lot of work in terms of medical and humanitarian, but very little in the way we strengthen the actual health system of those countries. And it, in a way, it answers your question because, yes, the context might change. The crisis will change. It will always change. It will always be something different, and, and the way it presents itself is very much different. So maybe the answer is we should stop looking at the country or the context or the crisis and actually look at the health system. And that's actually the, the, the – there's a big conference in Vancouver going on next week, which is exactly with that theme, strengthening health systems, is looking into – the answer that we all are might be looking for is actually how best to strengthen the health systems that exist as opposed to, because allow, if you strengthen the health system, then it's more able to equip to answer to any crisis and any changing context that happens. Does that sort of answer your question? There's a question online. So we'll go uh, to the online chat box for a minute for a question from uh, one of our Queen Elizabeth scholars who's currently in uh, South Africa. Uh, so would you mind elaborating on your field experience in Jordan? Was there anything that surprised you or challenged any prior assumptions you may have had before? So to be fair, I, I have to admit that I am Jordanian. I'm a Jordanian citizen, born actually in Jordan. But I haven't been back in Jordan in 11 years. And it was my first trip back in 11 years. It was a very difficult trip. And I, I say that with a heavy heart because shockingly to some people in this room who know me well, I'm actually not a very emotional person. So it takes a lot for me to sort of, I guess because I'm a doctor, I'm a physician by training, so I'm used to the idea of, uh, you know, I'm a bit desensitized to life and death, as sad as it is. But I've never been shaken to my core like I was in Jordan. And it left me with one big reflection, just to summarize it that it's hard for us people who do research in PhD programs or master's programs to realize the impact of our work in the real world. But it is only through field trips like this and work like this that you see the impact of research in the way people's lives are changed. Because the way, for example, we, I, the, one of the pictures actually were to promote this event was taken from one of the big, the, the only hospital that takes care of trauma patients in burn. They focus on burn. And I was shocked that there wasn't a single adult in the hospital. There was 342 inpatients, and all of them were children. All of them. And to me, that's, I think, what speaks to health research. And anybody who's looking into doing research that has some kind of, some kind of influence is that don't assume that you working away in a lab and plugging away at data and trying to analyze it that it won't have an impact somewhere in the world. Because some of the research that I already started doing about how we can transfer research evidence, I saw it into practice. And that was a perfect example of that. So I, I'll leave it at that because I, I am going to touch on it on my next slide, my last slide. So actually, I think that's a perfect point. So if you still have questions, we'll get to them in a minute. But that's a, actually a perfect segue into kind of the last section of Faraz's talk, which is more of the, the personal experiences that, uh, you know, that led him to where he is today and what Elizabeth Scholarship Program and his journey here. So I'll turn it over to you, Frost, for that more personal side of things. Thanks, Jay. This slide actually took the hardest to make, as fun as it is. By the way, I was up like really late trying to make this slide work. Um, I wanted, I, I kept thinking about this. I'm coming at the end of my QE journey. Uh, December will be my last month. And I think what's, I, I put this for idea forward is that it's important to talk about the overall journey. And I'm still reflecting on a lot of it. I unfortunately haven't had the downtime since my internship to really sit down and think about what I have learned and what I have gained. And I'm going to take the next few months to do that. But for you in this room who are, or online who are looking into joining the QE scholarship, here's what I think 
here's what my journey looks like. I started off in McMaster, came up with this idea that, you know, I really want to see what, I, I worked for WHO for a very long time. I wanted to see what other organizations do and how they implement care. I wanted to sort of connect to my thesis that has to be relevant to what I'm doing. So I put forward the idea to go to MSF and, and do this work. And I won't lie to you, it was a very scary journey. And up until the minute of me packing my bags to, to leave on the scholarship trip, I was hesitant and I doubted it over and over and over again. And, and we had our comprehensive exam for you, those of you who don't know what that is. It's, a, it's, a, it's an exam that PhD students have to take in order to proceed forward in their program right before my scheduled trip. And the idea of being able to go for three months isolated from the rest of the world while my colleagues are still working on the research, it's, it's scary. The point I'm trying to make is that I'm 33, I just turned 33 last week, and in my 33 years of life, not a single journey has been more rewarding than my QE journey. And I mean that full heartedly. Because it, but it's not so much, as much as it is about QE and the support that QE provides it, it's this concept of challenging yourself of being afraid. And I think that's what I'm learning. And I'm humbly learning it day by day, is that it's okay to be scared. I was traumatized to go to Jordan and to go to the refugee. I was really worried, I won't lie, because I don't know how it's gonna react. But it opened up a whole new perspective for me. From being in the UK, I got to travel to, I went to the International General Assembly, which was, you know, it was a last minute decision. I was, more, I will never forget it, I was on my way to a meeting and one of the big senior people said, do you want to come to the International General Assembly? And what, it, what that is, is that where they pick the next international president of the organization and make the big decisions. Three days, I attended the whole conference. It opened my eyes to how decisions are made. That there's actually a human element the way decisions are made. That people's emotions are involved. It's not all what you read in, in books and movies. That there is a, a science and a method behind it. I got to travel to Barcelona to different operational centers, to Geneva, to Amsterdam, to Jordan. Um, and I had much more chance to travel a lot more within the QE. But what the QE provided me, I think that's what's really important to, to, to really highlight here, is that it is truly a diverse network of global leaders. And I really mean that. You feel the backing of, a, of a people that believe in your, in your journey and your support. And, I, and there are a few QE scholars in this room right now who can, I think, speak to that too. There's an excellent support within the McMaster Health Forum. I never felt alone. So this thing I was talking about, about being, being scared and, and terrified of going on this trip, would sort of calm me down, and I know it's gonna sound really silly to some of you, but I was asked to do a Twitter account to go on this trip because they wanted to promote the QE. And I won't lie to you, one of the things that helped me calm down was Twitter and knowing that if anything happens to me, if I just put hashtag QE scholars, there was somebody going to be there that will see that. And it might be so stupid, but that's when it hit me. I was like, that's what they mean when you're tapped into this diverse network. It's not a, it's not a cliche thing, but it, for me personally, it was a safety and security. Is knowing that no matter what happens to me in the world, because I was traveling everywhere, that there is, there is people looking out for me. There are people supporting me. A, they support me financially, which is very important. With the QE comes a financial stipend, which for people who do research at the, at the graduate level, we all know that money is, becomes a very big issue. But most importantly, there was administrative support and, and psychological support in a way of knowing that when I email and say, you know, things are not really going that well, I'm really focused on this, and I, here's some help. Here's where you can direct your resources. So I, I want to be able to address anybody's questions about it, but, and, I, I, and you know, if you ask me maybe in four months from now, I'll have a lot more insightful reflections about them. But I could say that there are so many exciting events that came out of my QE that I never would have anticipated or expected for them to come my way. But don't be mistaken that you have to seek those opportunities. They won't be handed to you. You have to understand that if you're doing work within the QE scholarship, that you need to actively be promoting your work and, and finding a way to make an impact to the research that you're making and tap into this amazing network. James said something very smart one of the first times we had a meeting about the QE. He said, you're not a QE just for one year. Technically, my term is up in December. You're a QE scholar for life because there's a part of it that comes with mentorship. And I see that with other similar types of scholarships like this one, the Rhodes Scholarship, the Trudeau Scholars. It's this concept that you belong to a network of people 
that will support you and understand your struggle. I understand a fellow QE who traveled. I know the struggle they went to. I can relate to that. And I think that bond will carry you forward forever. So if whoever is thinking about a QE scholarship or similar thing, similar experiences, please do reach out and talk to us and we'll be happy to provide the information you need. I think I'll just end it at that. Unless, well, I'll take questions. So thank you very much for us. So uh, again, an opportunity to ask questions. So you can either ask questions about the work that he did while he was uh, a Queen Elizabeth Scholar or uh, anything about the scholarship uh, program itself. Uh, if you have anything that you might, might want to ask him, uh, feel free to do so. So go ahead. A personal journey kind of a question. So Faras is a, an MD, a medical, a medical doctor, and the question is how did you go from clinician, from being a bedside kind of uh, physician, to working in health, po health policy in the more stakeholder governance kind of level? It's a very personal question, and my parents, no, that's really good, my parents would love to talk to you about this forever, because my father is constantly reminding me how much he pays for medical school, and why I'm not a clinician, I'm not a real doctor anymore. That question all the time, and I have to address it. The, the reality is, I, you know, when I was in med school, I, I sort of hesitated a lot whether I was doing the right thing. And for, for those who go into medical school, you will have that doubt throughout the time, because of a very intense journey that medical school is. I don't regret my decision of leaving, of doing medicine. I think in retrospect, and I'm, I'm old enough now and, and, and honest enough to say that I wish I actually kept up with my clinicals. I'm no longer a clinician because I think it allows you to have a, a bit more of a critical lens. Nonetheless, if it wasn't for my medical training or my medical education, I don't think I would appreciate the suffering and understanding of what it takes to deliver health care to the patients. So the reason why I made the departure is because I knew early on that I always wanted a more of a global perspective. I wanted my work to impact more population level and individual level. And I, the, unfortunately, the reality of the way healthcare is delivered by healthcare professionals and physicians is that you are more, mostly have an impact on your immediate patient and immediate community rather than on a population level and a, and a global perspective. And in order to do that, I had to step away. And that's why I joined WHO because I was looking into more of a global perspective to deliver healthcare. Um, my advice to people who come to me now who who sort of followed my trajectory, my career, saying, you know, should we do the same or should we keep up with our clinicals? My advice is always try to always keep up with your clinicals because, it, and I do that now by teaching. So I, I maintain my teaching within clinical practice because I think there's still an importance to understand what it is like to diagnose the disease and manage it. And, and I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Ross. Any other questions uh, from anyone in the room or online? Uh, feel free to use the chat box. Yeah, go ahead. The length of time and the amount of work. So three months, was it enough time for you to do the work that you needed to do? Would you prefer longer time? And uh, kind of a second part of that question is, do you think MSF would prefer somebody coming to do, coming to do that kind of work would, could, to be there longer, or uh, is three months adequate? It's a great question. Um, I'm going to be vulnerable and, and tell you the truth in that. I think professional-wise, I, I divide it to personal and professional. The idea of three months terrified the the living out of me because yeah that's it and because I was scared the idea of like I said earlier that my colleagues who are in the, in the PhD program were working on their thesis while I was taking a departure from that although it's fed into my thesis it was still separate was scary and you're three months away from home living in a foreign country and sort of figuring it out and people who've done it understand that very very much what it is like to be far away and, rem and removed from it MSF would have initially wanted uh, initially would have wished that my internship was much shorter because like I said about earlier because I came in thinking I have three months I need to get a lot done I was very hardcore about how am I going to get people who am I going to interview I need to talk to you and then I had to take a chill pill and calm down and what I'll tell you is this at the end of my internship I got offered a full-time position with MSF I respectfully declined it because I, I am very much committed to my PhD program, and I, it came back to it. And the thing is that came out of the conversation when they offered me the job is they realized that this whole KT has become a, a, an important thing that you need to address, and that they don't have the expertise skills for it. But it takes time. It took me three months to get that point, and it took me changing who I am in many ways, in the way I approach people, understanding that, wait, this is a new context. You need to adapt to it. And I have to say, it was by, I, mean, I always joke about it among my friends, it was the best summer of my life. I got to where I needed to go, I got into a relationship for three months, 
that's on a personal level, but it was an eye-opening experience in that sense. My advice to people who are thinking about doing this is three months too little or too long. I say find a time for it, but ensure that you can give adequate three months to it. Don't try to do this kind of experience or this kind of work and do it half. I'm trying to find a polite way. Thank you. Half half partedly. You need to do it full on. So you need to be committed to it day in and day out. And really take advantage of those three months, 90 days that come about. Because I remember actually, just to end on this note, I had it on my calendar the minute I got on my flight and I was counting down the days. Like I was like, oh my God, three months is so long. Like I cannot wait to get home. Like I remember on the flight, I was like, okay, for us 90 days, just keep the countdown. And then things were exciting. You are in a new context, you're in a new environment, you're meeting people, you're learning things. I got in a personal relationship, never expected that to happen. And, you know, life sort of takes its shape. And, and within my second month, my, almost my third month, it felt sort of like home. And it became weird. And the idea of actually leaving it became really hard, which even made harder the decision to reject the job. Although I'm very fully committed to my PhD because my supervisor is hearing this presentation that, you know, I, I knew there was not a discussion about me coming back. But yeah, it, but it took me to really be invested in it. So I hope that answers. Sorry, I'm off the real It's okay. Thank you very much for us. Uh, any other questions for anyone in the room? Another question, uh, if, so give people a chance to listen or to, to think about what question they may want to ask. So I'll bridge the two presentations. So the work uh, with the personal, um, putting my researcher hat on, hat on, qualitative research can be a challenge for people because you have to remove yourself from uh, you know, the work that you're doing, from how you ask a question in your interviews to how you code those interviews and start sifting through those interview transcripts. It can be a challenge to remove yourself. So I'm from a personal level. What was uh, the part of yourself you had to make sure you weren't including, uh, including uh, when you were going through the interview process? I'm going I'm to make this light because it's 5 o'clock. I kept reminding myself, pretend like you're Oprah Winfrey. When I, when I, no, but it was very quickly into my interviews that I realized, you know, I need to put on a different hat. It's exactly that. Is that I, you know, initially my interviews, and it's skill training, and this is the reason why I'm doing a PhD, is I'm, I'm trying to learn research, research methods. And it hit me that you can't come in and ask questions based on your own knowledge and experience. You've got to allow the interview to take its shape. And that's one of the things that come out of qualitative research. You cannot influence the responses that you get. And I actually remember after my first interview, because it was a disaster, I went home and like, watched YouTube videos of Oprah interviewing. Because you know, they always talk about how she's amazing at interviewing. And I realized she does something very smart. She actually never feeds the answer to, to the person. It's sort of she allows the conversation to happen. She's asking the question, but the answer is coming from the participant himself. And she just kind of gets them out of them by gauging the pulse of the person and sort of catering to what their needs are. And, and that's sort of how I went about my qualitative research interview skills. I, I was very uh, cognizant of not putting words into my participant's mouth, but allowing them to come to their own thought processes. And it was a lot more rewarding because when they actually ended up reading my report, they came back to me and said, this is exactly what I was trying to say to you, but you were able to put it into words. Advocacy into this type of research. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. Your questions are so good that I have like sweat down my back. Right? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> um, advocacy, excellent point. I mean, listen, in the work of humanitarian word, word advocacy is much the most important thing you can do because without advocacy, nothing else can happen. The problem becomes is that how you, I think the better way to, to answer this is how do you package work like this to appeal to people who are looking into advocacy about pushing forward those things? It's not my area of expertise. It, and I believe in Arabic we have something that says, Atil Khubiz the Khabazo. And what it translates for, for what it translates to is give the bread to the bread maker. Let the person who's an expert in that field do what they're supposed to be doing. So in, in the terms of advocacy, I think it takes people who, are, who know how to advocate this kind of research and package it in order to appeal to the masses and, and, and push forward the agenda that needs to happen.
Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today uh, here in uh, the Health Forum at McMaster and online. And thank you very much, for us for uh, your wonderful presentation and for giving us a little insight into the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program. Please check our website. The links are here are on the screen. Uh, the second link gives you a list of all of our webinars that are still, we have still some upcoming. And uh, well, there's one that's going to be at the end of the month, which I think many of you will find very, very interesting. Uh, and then uh, if you're interested in the scholarship program, please check that first link. And then the third link there is our blog site. So all of our Queen Elizabeth scholars will be writing a blog to talk about their personal experiences and, and what they uh, took from the scholarship program. So keep an eye on that website as well. And uh, I'll see everybody next time. So thank you very much.